This is Talking Mule Deer with your hosts, Steve Belinda and Jody Stemmler. Talking Mule Deer takes you on a journey to learn more about the Mule Deer Foundation, Mule Deer and Blacktail Deer Biology and Management, tips and tactics for hunting, conservation issues, and even features some of our corporate and celebrity partners. Now, let's start talking Mule Deer. We are here at the Western Hunting and Conservation Expo. I'm Jody Semler. And I'm Steve Belinda. And we're doing MDF podcasts. And today we have Heartland Bow Hunter here with us. We've got Sean Luchtel and we've got Mike Hunsucker. And we are going to be talking about how you go from being Midwestern whitetail dudes to muley fanatics. Guys, welcome. Thank you guys for being here. Thank you for having Glad us. Glad to be here, yeah. All right, so... Tell us a little bit about yourselves, how you got involved in, in hunting in the outdoors. What inspired you to, to start a show? I'll let Mike go on that. He does it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we both kind of have a similar background. Our, da- our dads were hunters and got us started involved. And Sean's dad was a little more serious bow, bow hunter. My dad was not a bow hunter. Um, it, was, it was a rifle hunter. And, um, but both of us naturally gravitated towards the, the archery side of things and, and got addicted and got hooked at a young age. And um, we actually went to high school together. Uh, oh, fun. And started hunting together in high school, and uh, started filming for fun, doing some uh, different video type stuff, and just just to share with friends and family was kind of our initial uh, initial interest in getting involved, and and uh, it's all kind of gone from there. Excellent. Now, where's home? I I know, but tell Kansas us. City. Yeah. Kansas, Kansas City, City, Missouri. Missouri. Yep. So, yep. yep. Very good. And do you, are you guys? Uh, do you stick bow? Is it compound bow? Compound. Compound bow. Comp- I mean, I, I mess around with the recurve for fun, but nothing. Yeah, we did the total archery challenge over there with uh, the, how'd with you the do? recurve. Yeah, we're pretty much experts now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did you hit those flying ones? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's oh, what we were doing. Oh, yeah. very good. It was, it was yeah, fun. So those are exciting. We were watching oh. and nobody was hitting them. Yeah. So I'm impressed if it, you it did. Tough, <laughs> yeah, we, uh, so we were doing a, co- a competition where people were shooting against us, and so first place was uh, only three out of ten. Oh, wow. Um, and there was two people that got three out of ten, but. The best I did was five at one point, and we were shooting it for an hour straight, so we got to figure it out. Right. Later, but yeah. But yeah. I, that was still the best I did, and I think I heard so somebody So that archery trap, right? Is that, that's exactly. what we're talking about. So they throw a little plastic yeah, a foam, dick or yeah. foam disc up in the air, and you got foam arrows. And, and it'd be neat if you could have that in your own house. Wouldn't it be <laughs> oh <my laughs> Seriously. Gosh. That'd be entertaining. I, I was uh, thinking about that. I was surprised how affordable they're like. What do you say that? How much they were? 44000 bucks. Forty-four thousand? No, four thousand. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I was gonna say like forty-two hundred. Like what I was gonna that's say. not affordable. Yeah, I, I would assume that's probably what they are about. 4, I assume so they're way trap more. Trap throwing machine, yeah. yeah. So cool. guys, I grew up hunting white-tailed deer on tree stands. Um, then moved out west in my early twenties and uh, had to figure out how to hunt western species, particular mule deer. And I'll t- was it as a big a shock to y'all as it was to me with distances and. Dealing Absolutely. with wind and everything yes. else. I'm st- oh, yeah. We're still learning. I mean, this is what, like our eighth, ninth year uh, bow hunting mule deer, and we're still learning every year. Like this year, I came out here to Utah and hunted for, I think, like eight or nine days, missed two bucks, ate my tag. <laughs> <laughs> so. We all do it, don't yeah, we? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, but yeah, it, it was a huge change. Um, just being in a tree, stopping a deer, settling in, taking your time, making the shot, whereas out here, you it's never know stock, what's going right? to happen. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot stock. of yeah. glass on the, the side of the hillsides. So what, kind of, what kind of recommendations can you give the listeners on what they should prepare for, what, you know, distances to shoot? You know, I always tell people patience is a great thing in Western hunting because, you know, it's one of those things where you may bet a buck down really close, but you got to wait, wait, wait. So. Yeah, it, that was my biggest shock, I think, when I first started mule deer hunting was the just having to – be quick on the trigger and you know you don't get time to stop a deer and settle in like sean was saying yeah. um you got to take advantage of your, of your opportunities when you get them and um but what, what's so appealing to me about it is you can make stuff happen like in the you know back east in, in the whitetail world like you can't make a big buck you can't right. stalk a big buck you can't you know you got to wait for him to make a mistake out here you know out west you can find a big buck and uh you know they're easy easier to find and locate and you can make stuff happen you can get aggressive if you need to um, or you can be patient and wait them out if you need right. to, and I, I, that's what's really appealing to me. So where was your first mule deer hunt? Actually, western Nebraska. That's kind of where we, we uh, started at, and he, Mike started hunting first um, one year, and then the next year I followed up and, and did it myself. And then uh, it was probably a couple of years after that we started hunting different states outside of western Nebraska. And western Nebraska compared to here is a breeze. Like, it's just little rolling hills, and then out here you've got – Huge mountains, high altitude, can't breathe, yes. <laughs> far more elements. So. Yeah. It only gets tougher as you get older, guys. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I thought yeah. you were going to say as you go further west. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That too. No. Gets better because yeah. it starts going down again, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, so, so again, let's, let's think about some of the things that you had to learn 
to adapt your style of, of hunting to come out to these big open spaces? What was the, the first lesson? What was the first hard lesson you had <laughs> on a mule deer hunt? I, I Like I was saying earlier, like taking advantage of your opportunities. I was being, I was being too... Uh, waiting for things to be too perfect, you know. I I I'd blown a couple or got on a couple stocks and didn't shoot at a couple times that I should have, and it took me several blown stocks to realize, like, all right, you're not going to get a perfect opportunity. Like, you really need to, you know, be aggressive and take advantage of the opportunities you get. So, um, Sean was filming me on that hunt, and I know we were. It was getting frustrating for both of us, especially for him watching me, you know, be at full draw and not pull the trigger. <laughs> He's like, just shoot it, shoot, shoot it. Yeah. <laughs> um, but. So you live and learn. That's what I mean. That's exciting. Is is every hunt we learn more, and uh, we're constantly you know learning and, and changing our techniques and changing our approach. Um, but it never gets dull, and that's that's one thing that I really like about mule deer hunting. We were talking about earlier today in our seminar. Um, every everywhere we mule deer hunted is a little bit different. You know, you got the sand hills, you got the high country mountains, uh, you got desert. Uh, there's just so many different. Um, habitats that you can hunt them in that makes every hunt and each experience a little bit unique and that's what makes it exciting and keeps us coming back i'd say one thing that i've really learned to pay attention more attention to is is the animal itself like sometimes you'll give them the benefit of the doubt and you, you rush in there and try to get a shot and you blow the stock just by them hearing you smelling you whatever it may be and i am so focused now i feel like once you get within that last hundred yards of keeping my eyes on his rack and seeing where his head is faced right um and that's that's just something that I think I've blown a lot of stocks on because I, I wasn't paying attention to that necessarily. One of the things I learned is is quality optics yes. is a must oh in Western gosh. hunting. Yes. You can't use your small 10 by 28 compact binoculars <laughs> that you'd use in a tree stand back east. You've got to have good glass. That's exactly and right. And it's got to have a lot of light uh, collection abilities because you're going to be behind that glass for a while. So. And your footwear. Oh, my gosh. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, the first year that I came out here, I had some cheap boots. I don't, I don't remember what they cost or whatever, but oh my gosh, I was, I think I was like twenty five, twenty six, thinking I, I was just unstoppable. Nothing's gonna stop me. I, it doesn't matter if I have bad boots or whatever. And yeah, right up the mountain, I had blisters. And he was, you know, he was tiptoeing around real quick. Oh yeah. blisters. <laughs> yeah, it just wrecked my feet. So well, in apparel too. I mean, absolutely. White tail deer hunting, depending on the season you're hunting, you're sitting still uh, in a stand and not using a lot of extra energy or calories. But when you're doing spot and stalk, man, you're covering a lot of ground. So, yeah, so that's, that's exactly another right. thing that you have to adapt to as well. well. And then there's getting the animal out. A lot of times you're <laughs> oh in places where. You're in a hole or you're on top of a mountain and you got a couple hundred pound animal and you got to get them out on your back. You know? Sean could tell some stories about that. Oh, yeah? <laughs> yeah, that fir the first year that I, I killed a uh, buck in the high country. I, I, in high country uh, where? Uh, here in Utah. Okay. And um, so I, I, I had a super heavy pack coming out, um, which was good. I was happy. I had a big buck on my <laughs> yeah, back. Right? But um, I didn't have actually uh, hiking sticks and I had those bad boots. So a combination of that coming down just – tore my knees up and i was like 26 27 years old and i'm too young for this yeah <laughs> and so literally now anytime that i squat down and bend my knees my knees pop i'm 31 <laughs> years old i'm like man this isn't supposed to be happening yet but he forgot to mention the part about how they they, they took the path at least well the oh the shortest path that was a different oh time. yeah you yeah. can't uh, do that sometimes uh -oh. he's like oh it's just yeah, yeah so they the the deer had died on the back side of the mountain and so instead of going op up over the top of the mountain and back down the trail, they said, oh, we'll just go down this cut. Like, it looks like it's a straight shot down there, no problem. It was and a wash, uh, <laughs> and it, a wash down in the bottom of the valley. And you, we're sitting there thinking, coming from the Midwest, we're like, oh, it's like a creek. It'll be easy. We'll just walk right down it. <laughs> you get down there, and it's cliffs on each side, and there's boulders and, like, little waterfalls. And like, <laughs> we can't go. We, we can't go back, so we got to make our <laughs> way down this. And we did in the dark, and it took us, like, three four hours to get through that stuff and cost them some velvet <laughs> yeah cost now, velvet. now let me ask you guys this because i think this has happened to everyone new to western hunting you go out in the morning and it's t-shirt weather mm -hmm. and by the end of the day you're dealing with snow has yep. that happened to you guys where you weren't prepared um yes uh as far as rain gear goes yeah i didn't think that was a big deal until you're you're up there in the elements and it starts pouring on you in a thunderstorm and you don't and it was perfectly clear blue for yeah. the majority of your hunt. Then yeah. all of a sudden, boop. <laughs> yeah, it could be it could be bluebird day, and like an hour later, it's a huge thunderstorm just blew up right in front of you, and you're soaking wet. And it's not fun when you have wet feet 
or just a wet body. You get cold real quick. So unlike Jody, you were talking about um, you know being from the Midwest and, and usually wearing being bundling up and trying to stay warm. And out here, like it might be cold, but you're hiking and you're really you know exerting a lot of force. So you can't be bundled up or you get, get all sweaty. And if you get sweaty, it's it's no good. So yeah. layering was a big thing that we learned is you know layering, having a good layering system, having a good portable, light packable. Uh, Primo loft jacket to keep you warm when it does get cold when you're sitting up on top of the hill glassing and because um, there's times when you're sitting still just glassing for hours and then there's times you're hiking and uh, going up steep elevation and, and your heart's racing so uh, having layers and being able to you know change clothes and be comfortable is, is key. We ran in we did run I'm thinking of snow we ran into a, a nasty snowstorm uh, for a few days out in Alaska we went blacktail hunting oh. probably four or five years ago and in December, and I'll never go back then again. <laughs> it's daylight like six, seven hours out of the day, and it was just miserable. I think we had like 80 mile per hour winds coming off the ocean, like blowing water, salt water onto us. <laughs> Where in Alaska was it? Kodiak Island. Kodiak Island. Oh, yeah. so. Excellent. And you got the bears to worry about too. You know? Yeah. <clears throat> well, most of them weren't going to hibernate, thankfully. So when you guys are planning a hunt, is this something that you spend uh, quite a, a month before mapping it out. Do you, do you make visits out to do some scouting? Tell us about your prep a little bit. We don't have, unfortunately, don't have enough time to do a lot of uh, uh, visits, you know, previous visits to do some scouting and stuff. But we do, fortunately, have a lot of relationships with people in the industry and, um, you know, are able to get some at least prior knowledge from people uh, that help us when we're planning our hunts. And obviously, you know, producing the show that we do, we it's, it's tough because, we have to take advantage of every you know opportunity we get, and we have to make sure that you know these hunts that we're going on are at least you know pretty high percentage of us being successful. You know we can't waste our time on on uh, areas where there's you know low deer numbers, and we're not going to be successful. So, uh, but you know we enjoy the challenge, and we're willing to work hard and do whatever we need to do to be be successful. So uh, there is a lot of preparation that goes into it, and um, every every you know area is a little different. We do. We've done hunts where, you know, in some of the more trophy units where we get a landowner tag or get, you know, get a tag uh, through the draw point system. But, um, you know, we've hunted some general units, too, that are super, you know, and over-the-counter type stuff that are super easy tags to get. Um, and you just got to be willing to outwork the next guy. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm trying to think here. Um, we, yeah, we, there are certain hunts that we don't have really hardly any knowledge going into it. And, and that's something that we really enjoy is actually learning the area and figuring things out and just, you know doing our own thing well you know as a, as a former federal biologist it always frustrated me those folks who you know didn't produce a tv show where they were only coming out either for the first time or for you know have been out before and they would call you the day before they got there and say i'd oh. like to shoot a 30 inch buck in a you know six point uh, elk in five days and i'm showing up tomorrow <laughs> and you know you want to help folks but you're just like oh yeah. man do your homework yeah. you could have called me in the summertime or you could have wrote you know written me a letter or an email and i could have given you but you know it just seems to me that that preparation is so essential to a quality hunt it sounds like you guys really do your homework whether it's yourselves or with you know uh other folks helping you out to make sure you're successful. Absolutely, and th that's a good point, too. Like, at, at home, um, we do shoot a ton of arrows throughout the summer, just preparing long-range stuff, um, so we're comfortable with shorter distances as well. Um, and then I, I try to stay in the best shape that I can throughout the summer, so when I come out here, I kind of have a little bit of an edge, except for our elevation's like, what, 500 feet at home? You come out <laughs> yeah, here, and it's like... Yeah, you can't prep for you that. You can't prep for you that. You cannot prep no, for that. No, it's so, unbelievable. So what do you do? When you're here. Try your hardest. You try your hardest. <laughs> so I mean, you, you don't have an acclimate. You just keep Honestly, working. Or you do yeah. back off. Do you know for sure that that's going to be an issue? So your first few days of your hunt, you know the, not to push yourself so hard? The, the pack-in is the far worst part of the entire hunt, I feel like, because you're not acclimated. And you're, you have you're going on your in. Back. Yeah, everything's on your back. You're going up to your camp. And you just it just kind of ruins you for the rest of that day at least and then you wake up early that next day and you're still recovering yeah. trying to recover it it takes three four days up there at least for, well, for an us. altitude sickness is nothing that i mean it can no, really you're exactly can right hurt you and even kill you you know i i have a lot of people come out to hunt and visit me and i live you know at six thousand feet they drink lots of water mm -hmm. carry chapstick <laughs> And, you know, when roll aids used to be out there on the roll form, it had magnesium in it. And for something, I don't, I'm not a chemist, but, you know, that would help. And I'd say just, you know, pop a couple of those a day. And you could get over that initial shock a lot quicker. But mm -hmm. it is serious. And, and, you know, we take people off the mountains every year for altitude sickness and unprepar 
unprepared. And unfortunately, we see animals left because people can't get them out because of not being prepared. So. That's exactly yeah. right. There's typically a group of us, about three or four guys when we go. Um, and so that's been a huge help. I, I still can't fathom some of these local guys that go up there and kill deer, you know, way out in the middle of nothing. And then they pack that deer out, out of there, which they do. They do it. It's just, that's unbelievable to me. Yeah, that's a so lot of work. <laughs> um, but back to the altitude thing, when we were, we were hunting this past year, um, we had a local guy that had followed us up the trail. He was just trailing behind us. He'd been on the mountain numerous times before, but all summer last year, he had worked in Chicago doing construction. And he came home the day before the season opened, or I'm sorry, two days before the season opened. That next day, he hiked up the mountain, and he got altitude sickness, and he'd never experienced that in his entire life, and he grew up here and everything like that. He got, he got pretty sick, and he ended up just walking back off the mountain. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's nothing, nothing to play with. No, it's not. No. Now, I assume you guys follow what's going on in the conservation world. Um, have you heard of chronic wasting disease? And, you know, how is that? How do you guys think uh, that's going to change the way, you know, you guys hunt and the way that we manage big game? Yeah, we actually are real familiar with it. Uh, being from Missouri, it's a kind of a hot topic up, you know, in Missouri. And actually, uh, one of our main properties that we hunt is in a CWD zone. Yeah. And so... Um, you know, all the all the our the Missouri Department of Conservation is is uh, doing a lot of, of stuff to help prevent spreading of the disease, and they're doing a lot of testing. And um, during the rifle season this year, actually, um, we had to uh, if you kill a deer in the rifle, we had to bring it in and have it tested. Um, and so they're doing a lot more, and it's it's an interesting topic because it seems like there's you know a lot of unknowns out there, and and nobody really knows exactly you know everything about the the, the disease. And so um, it's kind of scary a little bit. You know, it's it's definitely going to affect us you know in, in the midwest and you know other places in the united states so so there have been folks myself included at times that have been pretty critical of the outdoor industry media and the, te- and the production of tv shows because we we see shows that don't portray what hunting is all about and what conservation is all about what do you guys do in the production of your show to ensure that it's something that when it's put on the air, you feel is, is representing hunting, conservation, and all the things associated with it. That's exactly why we started our show. Uh, when we got started 11 years ago, there wasn't any story telling about anything about the hunt. It was a rock and roll kill reel, <laughs> you know, highlight reel of kill shots, and there was no conservation. There was no backstory involved, and, um, you know, we do a lot on the on the uh, you know conservation and, and, and side of things on in, you know in the, in the Midwest on the on the whitetail things we manage our farms and we do a lot of uh, habitat improvement a lot of stuff that that the MDF is involved in out west and helping the projects and and uh, you know we do it on a really small scale on our on our on our properties back home so um, yeah it's definitely you know we, it's it's really relevant to us and we you know when we first started that was kind of our our goal was to really create a our, our show was going to be a show that really told our story, the story of the, the lifestyle of a bow hunter and, and touch on all the stuff that goes involved because it, there's a lot of stuff that leads up to the kill and, and um, it's all that stuff that makes it so rewarding. You know, if it was easy and it happened every time we went out, it wouldn't be so exciting and so much fun. And just as much after the kill too, right? That's right. I mean, that's exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. So you referenced MDF. Um, you guys are spokespeople for the organization as well. Tell us about why you wanted to get engaged with a group like MDF, why MDF was the group that you chose to become engaged with? I think with uh, our, our growing uh, side of mule deer hunting and us, us enjoying it and doing more of it, I mean, it only made sense for us to become partners with the MDF. And not to mention we have good friends that are part of the MDF. And uh, the, the whole mission behind it, um, just conserving the, the land and the, the population of the mule deer and, and blacktail as well, yep. um, I think that it's just completely made sense with our mission and what we were doing and exactly what Mike just talked about. Well, yeah, and it's so. pretty cool because we, you know, our audience and our, our appeal is mainly, you know, the whitetail hunter and, and it's, you know, as being, you know, us being whitetail hunters, probably without the us, you know, having the show and actually, you know, traveling and do a lot of hunts, I don't know that we would have made it out west. And so, like, it's it's cool for us to open people's eyes to that, you know, something new and, and uh, in order to, you know, mule deer hunting to be around and, and be available for everybody to do it, you know it needs to be taken care of and, and things need to be done and to to uh ensure that that's still around for you know our kids and, and the future and so um you know we actually got involved like sean said by um aaron olger who uh we worked with at bushnell yes. who was a he's on the board of the mule deer foundation and brian Feenhold as well um both guys that you know are from the midwest and and were you know 
big uh, supporters of the Mule, Mule Deer Foundation and, and were Mule Deer hunters. And so, um, you know, they, they were the ones that kind of opened our eyes to it. And so, you know, we're just trying to do our best to open others' eyes. Well, and that uh, that's something that I appreciate, appreciate about you guys and your show is, again, we grew up back east. Um, we've been lucky enough to live in the west for a while. But being able to, to – my, my grandfather used to come out and with my great uncle and – and go out to eastern Montana and, and, you know, hunt mule deer. And I remember that. And I remember that mule deer on our wall. And it was a big deal. Not a lot of people do um, from back east. There's a lot of opportunity here. And it and to engage a whole additional group in in protecting our western, ra- you know, rangelands or our sagebrush areas, um, getting them connected to mule deer is, a, is a, a tremendous to see what a resource it is. Um, yeah. So telling that story is important. And, you know, you talk to anyone that's been around hunting or attending sports shows, mule deer ends up on the bucket list pretty quickly. Absolutely. And, you know, I have family that, that we're in a process right now of planning an eastern Montana mule deer hunt for this fall because they're seeing what I'm doing and what I'm exposing my children to and the stories. And they're like, you know, let's do this. And, you know, that's one of the great things about MDF is they are giving back. They're they're focusing on the future. They they're they're really connecting the habitat work to the populations with the state agencies, with the federal agencies, and you know, ensuring that when someone wants to pull that bucket out of the list, that there's going to be mule deer to hunt. Mm-hmm. And you know, one of the things we as biologists look at is you know, mule deer is a species that's on a long-term decline right now. Some of it's habitat, some of it's unknown, some of it could be predators, and that, and it's going to take an organization like this leading the charge with people like yourselves and a lot of others to turn that around to ensure the future of, of mule deer. And, you know, to me, I've, as a biologist, I spent a lot of time, you know, in the field and used to see bucks out the wild, but I never really caught the big mule deer bug. And, you know, I, I love to hunt them, but I... You know, and now I'm looking, did I miss the, the mark on shooting that big mule deer with my bow when I, you know, 20 years ago when there was, I was seeing them a lot. But hopefully, with everyone's help, we're going to get back to the point where that's not going to be such a, a, a dream and it becomes more reality. So, well, Thank you guys for spending time with us today. Thank you for what you do with your show, Heartland Bowhunter. If, if people want to get more information or look, figure out where they can see and tune into your show, how can they get information? Just about any platform. No. <laughs> we're on, so we're on the Outdoor Channel Thursday nights, um, 9.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Um, we're on Carbon TV as well. We have two original series on there, Behind the Draw, that um, is all big game hunting, and then um, Full Strut, which is our, our turkey series, mini turkey series on there. Um, we're on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, um, the works pretty much. So. Well, great. Well, thank you for what you do for Mule Deer Conservation, for the Mule Deer Foundation, and for spending time with us here today. Thank you. Yes, guys. gentlemen, Absolutely. thank you, you know, and hopefully it's all bullseyes from here on out. So. Yeah, so, uh, <laughs> we'll see about that. <laughs> <laughs> so from the Western Hunting and Conservation Expo, I'm Jody Stemler. And I'm Steve Belinda. Until we talk to you. Thanks for talking Mule Deer with Steve Belinda and Jody Stemler. The Mule Deer Foundation is the only conservation group in North America dedicated to restoring, improving, and protecting mule deer and black-tailed deer and their habitat. MDF is a strong voice for hunters in access, wildlife management, and conservation policy issues. To find out more, visit www.muledeer.org and stay tuned for the next episode of Talkin' Mule Deer.